Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and also help them to succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas, and I graduated with a degree in civil engineering from UT Austin. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers, practicing on structural projects in California with an undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's degree in structural engineering from UC San Diego. In this episode, we talk to Mustafa El Mogi, an active researcher, passionate instructor, and highly talented structural engineer about high-rise structural design. Mustafa will also talk about the structural engineering profession and provide some great tips for aspiring structural engineers. Our sponsor for today's program is Giza Steel, a design software specifically created for structural steel connection design. Giza supports over 400 connection configurations in the shear, moment, vertical, and horizontal bracing groups. Selected as an AISC Modern Steel Construction Hot Product for the past two years, Giza continues to expand its connection library and add new tools that help users spend less time on connection design and produce concise and thorough design reports. You can try Giza today for free by going to www.gizasteel.com and downloading the 15-day trial. Giza, created by steel design professionals for steel design. Again, that's www.gizasteel.com. Now, let's jump into our conversation with Mustafa. Mustafa, welcome to the Structural Engineering Channel podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Before we dig into the meat of today's interview, can you share with us a little more detail of what you do currently in your role at Structural Engineering Basics? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Structure Engineering Basics is an online platform. I co-founded it with uh, Noah Moscovich. And uh, it's basically a platform to help people understand the basics of structural engineering without getting into too much equations or long formulas or anything. And uh, we basically created it because uh, we found a need for people that work with structures in the industry um, that wanted to understand uh, the basics and be able to lead their teams or like hire a structural engineering uh, team and communicate efficient efficiently with them. Uh, even students found it interesting uh, to learn bo- more about the profession and what structure engineering is like. So uh, this is uh, a program we're really excited about. And if your listeners are interested, um, I created a, a discount coupon if you want to check out our website. Uh, and we can talk about this uh, later. Awesome. I know you do have a a really cool career path. Could you go into that? How'd you get into structural engineering and what got you interested into structural engineering? Absolutely. I'm originally from Egypt. I grew up in Cairo and this is where I did my undergrad. Uh, I was um, genuinely interested in buildings and structures and wanted to know how they're made. And uh, I think also a big part of it was my father. He's a structure engineer. So I thought, hmm, that's an, that's an interesting uh, thing to, to study. I didn't know much about what structure in, engineers do, but then I realized like for, for tall buildings, it was structure engineers that did all the number crunching and design. So I did my undergrad in Egypt, and shortly after graduated, uh, graduating, um, I got an opportunity to work in Dubai. So I was very fortunate to get ex- this experience because in a way, it shaped my career. It was there I was exposed to the design of tall buildings. Uh, you know, Dubai, they have now the tallest building in the world. And um, that was an excellent opportunity for me to uh, learn what goes into like the consulting side and design of tall buildings. Um, and then I moved back uh, to Egypt to do my master's and eventually decided to move to Canada to do... Uh, uh, a PhD in uh, structural engineering, and eventually I got my uh, professional engineering PN designation and practiced uh, engineering consulting, and also taught engineering at university. So uh, 
yeah, looking back, I got an opportunity to do uh, lots of things in the uh, uh, structure engineering uh, profession. That's really impressive. And I love that you have such a really nice, well-rounded background where you did a little bit, you know, you've, you've been to different countries, so you understand the differences and the, some of the nuances that happen, um, not only with structural engineering practice, but culture. Um, that actually, if any of our listeners are, are tuning in, that is a great follow-up and a great opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about some of what Anne was telling us in our last episode using the Global Practice Guide. Um, so it's, it's great to have you on. That's a great follow-up. Um, I also, I think it's so fantastic. You went back to school. I know a lot of people, um, especially young engineers are always juggling with this opportunity of, you know, do I want to go back for a master's? Do I want to go back for a PhD? What is the value there? Why do I want to pursue that? How is it going to help get me to the next spot? Is that another investment that is going to pay off? Like my undergraduate degree was, why did you choose to go back to school? That's a great question because, um, I remember by the end of my undergraduate program, you know how like engineering and, and uh, structural engineering courses, they're very heavy and, and uh, by the end of it, I was like exhausted. I thought, okay, that's it, that's it for school. I don't wanna go back to school. And um, I started working, so I got this uh, opportunity to go work in Dubai. And then I realized um, what structure engineers actually do and like the uh, uh, especially on the consulting side like the design and the huge responsibility like the designer has and i thought wow you know what like going back to school and getting more more courses and more theory and focusing on the things that i realized i'm genuinely interested in in practicing in the profession so that was my way to a master's degree so i would say uh, if you're interested in, um, you know, um, being a consultant, doing design work, a master's degree would be like an excellent way to get more technical uh, experience and, and, and uh, uh, strengthen your kind of background in like the engineering design. The PhD uh, decision for me, it was, it was um, a whole bunch of uh, things at the same time because uh, I was working in Egypt and then this opportunity came to move to a new country, a new culture. I had to learn the language, uh, eventually practice engineering in a different country. So I had to learn the design codes um, and a whole bunch of things. And uh, the PhD uh, fit nicely in like the work I already did in my master's. So for me, it was like an excellent step to start the profession in a new country. Um, and I was fortunate. It helped me in, in many ways. I got a chance to uh, publish the research work I worked on with the research team at university in um, peer-reviewed journals and uh, international conferences. So that helped me with like my technical writing skills, uh, uh, obviously helped me with like teaching engineering uh, later on. And even with the professional engineering, just like in terms of getting the license, the designation, uh, the, the time I spent working on my research counted as experience because my advisor is, is a PN, just a professional engineer. So it counted as working under the supervision of the professional engineer. So I guess it depends. For, for, for each case, you'll have to weigh the, the benefits and what you're going to get out of it because at the same time, you don't want to waste time and uh, go do a degree that you're not necessarily going to use. But at the same time, if you can uh, tap into the, the benefits of like going back to school and getting uh, more education, you will set yourself definitely ahead of the competition. Absolutely. Um, just so that our we can all understand a little bit more, you keep mentioning PN, which I understand is the Professional Engineering License of Canada. Um, can you explain to us and our listeners kind of what the process is to get a PN so that we can understand how it compares um, in relation to the professional engineering licensure path? Yes, absolutely. So I guess this is the equivalent of the PE in, uh, in the yeah. uh, United States. Right. So um, the, uh, the PN in, in Canada, so each province, each part of Canada, it has its own association that regulates the practice of um, professional engineering and they list a uh, set of requirements so it starts with like a uh, 
a degree in engineering, so a bachelor degree or something like that. And there is usually a committee that will uh, assess the uh, academic qualification. And if you're deemed qualified, then there is the next step would be like um, an exam. Like um, uh, it doesn't focus on the technical stuff. It's more like the ethics and the uh, practice of engineering ethics. Uh, it's it's uh, sort of like a pass or fail exam. And um, before that, there is a four year time of like practicing engineering as a member in, in training. Uh, during this time, you should work under the supervision of a professional engineer uh, and uh, submit like a regular report uh, that outlines your experience, what are the tasks you worked on, and um, your advisor or supervisor typically um, will uh, sign uh, or like will help in writing the reports and have some sort of role there. And by the end of it, you do the pass or fail uh, exam. And um, the last step is like three reference letters. By the time you get the three letters, they send it to the association and you hear back and say, well, congratulations, you're ready to get your full engineering license uh, yes. designation. That's awesome. I'm, I'm glad to know and I, I appreciate you spending the time to kind of share the process with us. I know that's not the main topic of today's presentation or, um, or episode, um, but I do think it's good for our audience to have a little bit of understanding of what are some of the licensure and some of the um, qualifications even in other nations um, as, we, as our world continues to become more global and the opportunities to work abroad become more expansive. Um, I know there's plenty of listeners who are thinking, hmm, I could totally go do some time in Canada. I know I could, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's always good to know what, what, what's going on and what the licensure is uh, up in Canada or, or, or in other countries too. Uh, Mustafa, what are some of the most unique projects that you've worked on since I know you've worked on a lot? So uh, yeah, what are the things that pop out to you? Yes. Yes, interesting. So one of those definitely has to be a tall building. I was fortunate to be uh, part of the design team in Saudi Arabia. It's uh, one of the uh, top 10 tallest buildings in the world. It's famous for this massive clock on top of the tallest tower. It's, uh, it's huge. It's, uh, it's like 120 um, floors. That's like about 600 meters. That's uh, like I'm thinking in feet. Um, that would be, uh, I think in metric. So that's like almost 2000 feet. So uh, that, was, that was a very interesting uh, project. And what goes into the, uh, the design, the analysis, obviously for something that tall, we needed wind tunnel testing. And just like the sheer magnitude of the project, um, the project was built where a massive hill used to be, and there was like a huge amount of demolition to remove that hill to build a project. So, so the, the final cost, it was like billions of dollars. That was, that was a very interesting wow. project. Uh, another project that's most recently a top uh, project in, uh, in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba. This is the story structure challenges. It was built on existing foundations. Uh, the, um, the original kind of phase one was, uh, already built. And then, um, the, the new, uh, tower was supposed to come and sit on those existing foundations. And, um, that gave me an, an opportunity to work with consultants from different parts in Canada, the wind tunnel analysis and design. We did it with a, a consultant in Toronto, um, and just to coordinate and, and, uh, work with the architects, the electrical, mechanical engineers, and, and uh, answer the tough questions like how, how many floors can we get out of the existing foundations and uh, um, get, get a design that can work uh, structurally and with the architect as well. Uh, coordinating this is, is challenging, right? Because when you want to go taller, you want more walls and thicker walls. And the architect wants their, you know, doors and openings and windows. So it was very interesting to work on all these things. Wow. 
Could you go into more of, you mentioned the wind tunnel testing. I imagine that's one of the governing things that govern the design on these high rises. Uh, could you go into a little more about that and, and um, what the procedure is for that? Since I'm not too familiar with um, wind tunnel testing. So that's, that'd be, that'd be something really interesting that you can go into. Absolutely. So when buildings get taller, uh, the standard code kind of and um, design standards uh, wind load and equations to calculate the wind pressure on the uh, building become sensitive to the dynamic properties of the structure, the natural frequency. So think of the tower, the building as like basically a cantilever, which is like an inverted kind of pendulum kind of thing. And the time it takes for the tower when it vibrates to do a full cycle, this, is, this depends on like the dynamic, natural dynamic properties of the building. So the taller it gets, uh, the wind dynamic effect becomes um, uh, like part of like the uh, effect on the load, on the wind pressure. So some design standards limit the trigger to go to um, experimental testing. That's what wind tunnel is. Like it's an experiment. You, um, like consultants that work with uh, uh, wind tunnel testing, they would actually build a 3D uh, model of the tower with surrounding buildings to kind of create similar environment to what the actual building is going to be built in and test it in a, in a big wind tunnel like to see the effect on wind speeds and the uh, they would put all sorts of sensors to gauge uh, because of the shape of the building if there's going to be some like uh, uh, turbulence or some sort of like forces and they can record all that uh, the um, the consultant we work with uh, on this uh, project, they did an excellent job in creating uh, what they call a desktop study. So that helped us to get things going. Uh, this is like uh, using software, model the tower we're trying to build and use um, from previous experience, from projects they've worked on, what usually the, the, the forces look like. And um, I created a, a 3D model for the tower and gave them the um, uh, the stiffness and the natural frequency and the dynamic properties of the structure. And they were able to give me some sort of like uh, something to get because you will realize soon after you get the forces that there are certain criteria or certain things are not working. Like for example, the lateral deformation is too high or some sort of like vibration effect is, uh, is not where it's supposed to be. So I start uh, increasing the thickness of walls, adding new walls, adding outriggers, increase the um, stiffness of the material. Like for example, use higher strength concrete or something like that to get things to work. But just by the nature of changing these things, I change the properties of the building now. So the fundamental frequency is different. So I take that second iteration and go back to the wind tunnel uh, consultant and then do few iterations like that till we figure things out. So uh, the way they provided the loads for me was uh, point loads at each level in terms of force in the X direction, kind of horizontal version force in the 90 degree direction, kind of Y direction, and torsion, and the specific combinations to work that with. So it ended up being like, I don't know, 24 load cases with like the combination of all wind loads to make sure that they cover all cases that the wind will impact uh, the tower. And also provided some very useful graphs if I did some minor changes and changed the frequency or the stiffness of the building, I can go back and change the forces accordingly. So it was a very uh, good cooperation to figure out how to design that tall building. That's awesome. I, I first want to thank you for kind of walking us through the process of the iterative design process. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, helping high schoolers become introduced to engineering. And I work with this one teacher who's really good about um, really 
immersing his students in the iterative engineering design process because you don't just design something once you go through it over and over and over again you change something and you test it again and you change something and you test it again and i don't think they believe us sometimes they're like no you just like us to do this over and over again you just want to you know torture us so it's good for it's good for a professional to be able to share that so i'm going to make a shout out od wyatt high school and mr casal's uh engineering class this is a real thing i promise um, it is yeah. absolutely. It, it is. It absolutely is. I know Matt. I know Matt could speak about it all the time, but it's good to have a guest uh, kind of walk us through that process as well. Of course, of course. I think that is so fascinating. Thank you uh, for sharing with us about the wind tunnel testing. And it, it seems like such a complex system. I, I'm curious. Obviously, you you go back and forth, and you have to change different um, attributes of the building. But what are some of the outcomes in this in the actual building design? What are some of the lateral systems that you would use? Um, maybe what are some of the software that you would use to analyze this? And what are some of the construction materials you consider in different situations? Beautiful. So that's like uh, following up on what you just said. This is the uh, nature of design, especially for tall buildings, is that um, when you change the assumptions, the kind of the results change, and then you go and change the assumptions again, and then you'll get different results. So you want to start with... Um, so the idea is like, okay, we want the structure to be safe and we also want to uh, not over design it. We don't want to kind of overbuild it. So, so where do we start? So I usually start with uh, some um, reinforced concrete uh, uh, shear walls and uh, cores, usually around the stairwells and the elevator shafts. So most of the time, architecturally, these are just like dead, walls just to encase the stairwell or to enclose uh, the elevators and those are perfect opportunities for the structure engineer to just like use their put their uh, solid reinforced concrete shear walls there so if you start there and then you run the analysis um, maybe you do the wind tunnel thing you assign the loads and then you look at the um, results so there are certain things that you want to check first is the design going to be safe? Are the stresses in these walls within the allowable range or like the walls are just like overstressed and there is no physical way they can withstand all that load and pressure? So even if it's safe and you can, uh, the walls are, are good with the stress, you need to look at the deformation of the building because you don't want someone living at the top floor when it's really windy outside to kind of feel that massive movement of the tower that becomes really uncomfortable. So you want to check the deformation and the lateral movement as well. And this becomes like a function of the stiffness of the building. And um, the, the really the way you can control this is by either adding more walls or another thing I would do is connect groups of shear walls or cores together. So I would connect the elevator shaft stairwell with like coupling beams to create like a bigger, stiffer tube sort of thing to increase the inertia and the stiffness of it. And then run the analysis again. Uh, if, um, if that was sufficient to um, satisfy all the terms, you might as well like go ahead with like more detailed design and coordination and let everyone know, hey, these are the layouts uh, that work. So everyone can start working on their part of the design. If not, then you will start to um, try to engage the perimeter of the building. So now we're talking about like very super tall buildings. So this is where like ideas like exoskeleton uh, would, would come into play. Uh, you're, you're engaging the full, full footprint, like the perimeter of the tower to create like a, like a very stiff element and connect it with the inner reinforced concrete core so it can all work together to increase that stiffness and inertia and go higher uh, pretty much. So um, a few of the uh, material I've used in something like that would be uh, so reinforced concrete for shear walls works great because it creates that big uh, solid walls with uh, big inertia and stiffness Th those work very well uh, also steel steel columns steel beams uh, they work very well in the typical floors uh, for like a steel column it can go up to 40 
I've used them for 40s uh, floors. Uh, by the time you get to the uh, basement, if you can't find a thick enough concrete uh, steel uh, column to support the load, you might want to go to uh, concrete, reinforced concrete, or even a composite section. So it's basically uh, a steel column encased with concrete to resist the, the loads and the stresses. For the typical floor, I've used uh, holocore slabs. They are precast, pre-stressed. Uh, also post-tension uh, reinforced concrete work very well, especially with tall buildings and the typical repetitive floors because you can use thicker, uh, thinner rather, uh, slabs. So you can save on the weight, right? And you can save on the foundation, save on the columns uh, and things like that. So yeah, those were some of the materials that uh, I've used. Yeah, I think that's what's really cool about um, tall buildings or yeah, even super tall buildings. I I know when I'm looking at some of like the design concepts of some of these super tall buildings, it's they're they're really cool how they combine, you know, there's the strong core, but then like you mentioned, they might have outriggers or an exoskeleton, kind of like uh, those unique buildings where it really allows you to get creative on, on, I imagine with all the wind tunnel testing, they must be going through different types of shapes. And so I think there's like a, a lot of creativity can go into it. And I think that's what's really cool about those types. Uh, for, for our listeners, Mustafa, yeah. uh, I, I want to give them some professional advice. Do you have any advice for them? Let's say they do want to get into high rises. Is there a specific career path that they should go? Should they look for a specific type of company or should they get a specific type of experience? Do you have any advice for those types of people? Uh, absolutely. So you, uh, first step, I would say you need to kind of look inside. Does buildings and, and, and knowing how things work uh, interest you? Because if you're going to pick this as a, as a profession, you're going to be working a lot. You're going to spend, you're going to be spending uh, long hours in this like uh, process of like designing and changing things. So it, really helps if you're genuinely interested and it excites you to start a new project and see how you're going to figure out and design it. So you want, you're interested and you want to uh, go into this career path. Um, a, a civil engineering degree would help. So that's uh, that's at school. You might want to pick uh, the civil engineering uh, path and within your program, you start looking at what courses uh, interest you and you might as well pick the ones that uh, will enable you to uh, uh, take your career into the structural engineering. So structural engineering design, uh, you might want to take like some of the uh, analysis uh, uh, courses, uh, materials, structures, dynamics, uh, things like that. And I would also say try to get experience uh, as early as possible. So like, you know, first year, second year in, try to uh, uh, network and communicate with your colleagues, your professors, uh, and look for like what's out there and um, see how you feel about it. If there's a certain path or a certain career that interests you and try to learn more about it and uh, see, uh, ask the question, like approach it with like, you know, open, curious, like, hey, I'm interested. I'm curious about what you guys uh, do. Uh, how do I get there? How do I do this? Uh, can you learn me? Uh, can you teach me something? Uh, things like that. So those would be a few of the things that I would strongly recommend doing uh, as, as early as possible. There is no like uh, the best time to start preparing for your career is right now. Fantastic and universal words of wisdom. I love those. Thank you. What are some of the best steps, now that you've done a really good job setting up what an undergraduate can do, what are some of the best steps that a recent structural engineering graduate can take to further their career, especially when it comes to high rises? Yes, right. So, um, so it depends on where you start. So like you just finished and you're looking for your uh, perfect job and start your perfect career, or even if you started um, your work and you realize that it's a possibility that you're going to be working on tall buildings. So uh, I think networking goes a long way. So uh, you most probably the fundamentals and the basics, you got that covered in your uh, uh, program, like a bachelor's degree. So now it's going to be 
um, communicating with professionals that are ahead of you. And you might want to like look for mentors, someone that has the experience of uh, um, working on tall buildings and uh, ask questions. And, you know, uh, and you might think, well, you know, uh, absolutely, it is the case that, you know, professionals and engineers are super busy and uh, uh, you might think, oh, I don't want to bother, bother anyone. But for me, uh, I love it when when like a fellow engineer or a student approached me to ask about something because it's very rewarding to share back and give back, you know, things that I've uh, learned and see others kind of using it and uh, reaping the benefits uh, of it. So I would recommend looking for a mentor. I would recommend uh, paying attention and, and uh, keeping an eye open for opportunities. So uh, next time there is like a, work or project in the office and they're looking for someone to work on i don't know maybe raise your hand and say hey i'm interested in tall buildings uh let me give it a try and um in terms of like the technical part um i use softwares a lot uh there are like um a lot of finite element analysis softwares out there and i have so much respect for like uh, engineers back in the day before computers how did they do the analysis of, an analysis of these tall buildings? It's, it's crazy. Like think of this uh, iterative uh, process. Uh, can you imagine calculating the dynamic properties of a tall building over and over again? <laughs> By hand. <laughs> <laughs> By hand, exactly. So, so it, uh, it's definitely something that you will benefit from adding it to, to like toolkit. Um, look for... Uh, I can name a few of the softwares that I found very helpful. I use eTabs a lot. I find it oriented to multi-story buildings. Uh, and um, in terms of learning, uh, as I said, you can ask someone, you can look for a mentor, or you can Google it. Uh, YouTube has a lot of information, like would take you step by step. And then in, in, in a week, you're, you're, you're good to go and uh, use the tools. So uh, that's what I would say, like, just like raise your hand and summon up the courage and take the responsibility and then you'll figure it out along the way. I love that. Taking some self-initiative gets you a long way. Absolutely. Um, I know that actually Matt and I hosted a, uh, a, an episode regarding mentorship at the beginning of January, maybe. Um, and we had quite a bit of information. I'm glad we actually spent time talking about um, exactly what you, you just shared with us, Mustafa, which is there are actually lots of people who are busy out there who are more than happy to pass along wisdom and give advice and be a mentor. So if you have someone in mind that you want to mentor you, reach out to them and just ask because they don't, they can't, they can't help if they don't know that you want help. Yes, um, sure. And Matt, I kind of just want to make a little plug for you here since uh, Mustafa gave us a great leg up to say, to share with us that, you know, there's a lot of resources available on the internet, like YouTube. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I got a, you know, the whole channel thing too. It's, and it's a great way to share experience with the internet, you know, like, yeah, there's mentorship one-on-one, -on -one, but there's also a lot of opportunities on social media to share your knowledge, uh, especially if you're uh, in whatever technical stuff you do. A lot of people do just, just they just want to learn about it, especially the students, especially when they're growing up, they kind of see like these cool projects that you're working on. It's, it's a great way to to mentor, but also to help the structural engineering uh, profession to, you know, attract new talent. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Matt's killing think, it. And his, oh, yeah. So sorry. Go ahead. No, I think we're living in a very interesting time with like, uh, you know, uh, YouTube and uh, uh, podcasts. Like, uh, I love what you guys are, are doing. I think uh, this is like paving the way for like engineers to kind of uh, communicate together and maybe go out of the office a little bit and uh, do something other than crunching numbers and uh, sharing experience and sharing knowledge. Absolutely. Glad we have all these channels of communication. We can use them for good. <laughs> yes. Um, so I want to really quickly circle back before we close today's episode. I want to circle back to something you mentioned at the very beginning of the podcast, which was this structural engineering basics that you've developed. Why did you just start? Why did you decide to start this? Um, and as an online course, I so uh, as I mentioned, I co-founded it with um, Noah Moscovich. We used to work uh, together at the same uh, consulting uh, firm, 
And uh, we actually had like uh, cubicles right next to each other. And uh, during uh, work, we would get a lot of questions from our clients about um, something that would be like uh, covered under like the very basics of structural engineering. So we thought, hey, like there is a need out there for uh, the professionals and the people uh, that work with structural engineering uh, because structures affect our lives on a daily basis, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's, um, there is a lot of uh, need to understand the basics without getting into like the number crunching, the very kind of complex uh, formulas and things like that. And uh, we were uh, lucky to have very uh, uh, successful stories for people that took our course. Um, there was a project manager in uh, Japan, actually. He's responsible for like developing multiple buildings and uh, he was leading a big structural uh, engineering team and contractors and realized, hey, if I'm leading everyone, uh, I should get like an idea about the basics, what goes into structural engineering and building structures. Um, also, um, a contractor actually used uh, our course to train his staff so they're ready to do like structural engineering related, related work. So we're, we're very happy to see like the success stories and, and how there is a, a need for this information out there. So, um, I mentioned at the beginning that uh, if your uh, listeners are interested, I uh, created a coupon for them if they want to check out our uh, website. So um, our website is uh, structuralengineeringbasics.com. And we have lots of free content. We have like uh, blogs. Uh, we have um, a YouTube channel. Uh, we talk about different topics. And uh, there is also a free introduction course that gives you uh, a sample of uh, what's in the full structure engineering basic course. So you can sign up and you can also download a free guide. We call it the ultimate guide for structure engineering basics. It kind of nicely uh, summarize the important things that you need to know about structure engineering. So, um, if you're interested in the uh, course, uh, I created a coupon code. You can use that code to get a 10% discount. And the code is uh, SEC10OFF. So that's the Structure Engineering Channel, SEC10OFF, uh, all capital. And uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to hear from you. Uh, you know, if I if you have any questions, be more than happy to get in touch and answer your questions. Awesome. Thanks for that, Mustafa. We'll definitely link that um, in the description or you've already uh, said the channels. Uh, how can our listeners uh, connect with you? Do you have a LinkedIn or some way they can connect with you one on one? Yes, absolutely. So the easiest way would be our website and it has all the links and everything. We're also on Facebook, Instagram on LinkedIn. So um, as I mentioned, the, the website is uh, um, structuralengineeringbasics.com and an email to reach out, info at structuralengineeringbasics.com. And um, just check out our website, see if any of this interests you. Um, we also uh, recently created a, a course for uh, students or recently graduated engineers that talks about a lot of the things we discussed uh, today, how to get prepared for the job you really want. Uh, we're very excited about uh, this whole thing. So yeah, absolutely. I'm excited and looking forward to hearing from everyone. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mustafa, yeah. thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of your really great insights with us. Um, I know you've given us some really good information and our listeners some great resources to check out. Um, that's really going to help them advance in their understanding of structural engineering and in their careers. Thank you. My pleasure. That was really uh, uh, awesome experience. Thanks for having me. We hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, as well as links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. 
Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.